I'm going to talk to you all about precision nutrition, hope or hype for public health interventions for reducing the prevalence of cardiometabolic diseases. So what I'm going to cover in my talk today is basically the translation of nutrigenetics to precision nutrition. So for the development of various cardiometabolic diseases, it is not just the dietary exposure, there is also the involvement of various other intrinsic factors, such as your genome, your proteome, your transcriptome, your metabolome, microbiome, your epigenetic factors. So all these factors interact with your dietary intake, your lifestyle, your physical activity levels, your socioeconomic status, and various other social determinants, and they contribute to the development of various cardiometabolic diseases, such as obesity or diabetes or cardiovascular disease. But the key question over here is, how are we going to integrate all this information into one model? And integration of all these factors into one model requires a sophisticated platform. And that platform is nothing but the artificial intelligence or the machine learning approaches. And understanding of these approaches is very much required for the implementation of the personalized nutrition strategies. So this is exactly what I'm going to cover in my talk today, and I'm going to touch upon each and every area. So with this background, let me move on to the gene environment interactions on cardiometabolic diseases. So for the development of cardiometabolic diseases, there are two important factors. One is basically your lifestyle factor, which includes your dietary intake or physical activity or various other um, environmental exposures. And the second one is your genetic factor. You're born with these genes, your DNA. The, you cannot change your DNA or your genetic makeup. You're born with those genetic factors which are hidden inside your DNA. And what you can modify is basically your lifestyle. You cannot change your DNA. And this interaction of modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors, this interaction is what you call as a gene environment interaction, which can lead to the development of cardiometabolic diseases. And that's why we say genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. Even if you have the genetic risk, you can still overcome that genetic risk by modifying your environment. So you might be carrying your genes for obesity or genes for diabetes or genes for cardiovascular disease, but it is ultimately that environment that is triggering the development of the disease. Or in other words, it's basically the environment or your lifestyle that determines the health status or the disease status of an individual. So what is this genetic factor? So we call these genetic factors as a genetic variation. So for those who do not have a background in genetics, so let me explain what is a genetic variation. Say for example, this individual has got this DNA sequence and say this population has got five individuals. And you can see that 99.9% .9 of the DNA is the same in all the individuals. It is the 0.1% of the DNA which carries all the genetic variations. And these genetic variations are the reason why I look different from you and you look different from the person, for, from your friends or your family or any of the other people. So we are all unique in our own way in terms of our genetic makeup. So these genetic variations are the reasons why we are all looking different from each other. And this phenomenon is what you call as a genetic heterogeneity. Heterogeneity refers to the difference and genetic refers to your genetic makeup. The differences in the genetic makeup contributes to the differences in the way we eat or we walk, all your behavioral traits, your, um, your personality traits, your height, your weight, everything is determined by all these genetic variations. So if you look at this particular DNA, you can see that some people carry T and some people carry A. So if you take a, any DNA molecule, the DNA is made up of the four important nucleotides, A, G, C, and T, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So here you see there is a genetic variation where some people carry T and some people carry A. So there's a change from one nucleotide to another nucleotide. And this change is what you call as a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP, or you just call that as a genetic variation. So if you carry T, which refers to the normal nucleotide, and if you carry A, which is referring to the changed nucleotide, or which is basically the genetic variation. 
So depending upon whether you carry the genetic variation or not, you can classify individuals into three different categories. So namely as zero, one, and two. So if you carry just TT and no copies of the genetic variation, then you're classified as a zero copy individual because you don't carry any copies of the genetic variation. And if you carry one copy of the A and one copy without the genetic variation, you're classified as a one copy individual. And if you carry two copies of the genetic variation, then you're classified as a two copy individual. So for a given genetic variation or for a given single nucleotide polymorphism, you can only find three groups of individuals. That is either you can be a zero copy or a one copy or a two copy individual. In general, people carrying two copies, they have high genetic risk. So here I'm talking about one genetic variation or human DNA, which has got 3 billion nucleotides. The DNA has got nearly about three to 4 million genetic variations. So here I'm talking about one genetic variation. So just imagine if you carry two copies in all these genetic variations, so what's going to happen? You're going to accumulate your genetic risk. The genetic risk is going to increase. So having talked about genetic risk, what is a genetic risk? So let me explain this in a very simple way. So if you carry zero copy, it means that you have decreased risk of developing the disease. And if you carry one copy, it means that you have a moderate risk of developing the disease. But if you carry two copies, it means that you have increased risk of developing the disease. But this is exactly where you have the twist. Just because you carry two copies, it doesn't mean that you're destined to become diseased. You're not destined to become obese or diabetic or develop cardiovascular disease. You can still overcome that genetic risk by modifying your lifestyle. And what is your lifestyle? That is your dietary intake and your physical activity. So by consuming a healthy diet, and doing more levels of physical activity, you can overcome the genetic risk of becoming obese or becoming diabetic. So this is the underlying basis on which we do the nutrigenetics and nutrigenomic studies. So with this background, let's have a look at what is nutrigenetics and what is nutrigenomics. So nutrigenetics refers to the study of the impact of the DNA sequence variations on chronic diseases in response to a particular diet. So say, for example, if I'm consuming an uh, unhealthy diet, lots of junk foods, lots of fried foods, and on top of that, I have a high genetic risk. So what is the risk of becoming diabetic? In order to understand the risk, I need to look at the interaction between the, your genetic risk and your dietary intake. So this study of the gene-diet interaction is what you call as nutrigenetics. So in nutrigenetics, you're looking at the gene-diet interactions, whereas in nutrigenomics, as the name implicates, omics refers to expression, and genomics refers to the gene expression, and nutrigenomics refers to the impact of the nutrient on gene expression. So what is gene expression? Which is nothing but where the DNA is converted to RNA and RNA to protein. So there's a flow of information from the DNA to protein, and that is what you call as a gene expression. So when I say gene is expressed, it means that the gene is producing, the information in the gene is being translated to produce the proteins. And this gene expression cannot happen on its own. It requires an environmental stimulant, and that stimulant is nothing but your dietary intake. So the food that you're consuming has got all the nutrients, and these nutrients are literally stimulating the gene expression, expression of certain genes in your DNA. And that is why we say what you eat is what you are, because what you're eating is interacting with your DNA and contributing to what you are. And findings from nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics are essential for the implementation of the personalized nutrition. So what is personalized nutrition? So personalized nutrition is nothing but where you're developing an optimum diet for an individual based on that individual's genetic makeup. So in order to provide that personalized diet, you definitely require the findings from nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. So nutrigenetics is nothing but the gene diet interactions. So as part of conducting these nutrigenetics and nutrigenomic studies focusing on gene diet interactions and gene expression studies, so I'm leading two large collaborative network. So one is basically the DCardia collaboration, so which is basically focusing on 
developed parts of the world, that is the UK, US, and European countries. And this was initially funded by the British Heart Foundation. And to date, we have nearly about 35 studies comprising more than 100,000 individuals from different parts of the UK, US, and European countries. And also we are including some of the cohorts from Australia and New Zealand. So, and with access to the UK Biobank, which has got half a million people, and with access to various consortia-based studies, we have a sample size of nearly 1.9 million people. And uh, these are some of the publications from the DCardia collaboration. And the, and the other large scale collaborative network that I'm leading is basically the Genuine Collaboration. The Genuine stands for the Gene Nutrient Interaction, so which has been funded by the British Nutrition Foundation. And these are the countries in which we have implemented the nutrigenetic studies for the first time. And what you see in the brackets are basically the funding organizations that have supported my research activities in all these lower middle income countries. So this is exactly what I'm going to focus in my talk. So where I'm going to give you some examples of the studies that I did in the developed parts of the world and developing parts of the world. So starting with nutrigenetic studies in developed countries. So it all started off with the discovery of the obesity gene. So this obesity gene was discovered in the year 2007, after which there was a lot of attention to the area of nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. Even though nutrigenetics area has been going on like for the last two decades, especially after 2007, after the discovery of this particular gene, there was a lot of attention to this area of nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. But why? Because this gene was discovered in the year 2007 in two independent population at the same time. One was in the UK population and the other one was a Spanish population. So this gene, once this gene was discovered, people strongly believed that if they carry two copies of this obesity gene variation, they are destined to become obese. So to clear this fear from the minds of public, the genetic epidemiologists, they decided to test whether consuming a healthy diet or doing more levels of physical activity, can that overcome the genetic risk of obesity? Because that was a point when a lot of researchers started to focus on gene diet interactions or gene physical activity interactions. So, but what is so special about this obesity gene? This obesity gene is also called as the FTO gene. FTO stands for fat mass and obesity associated gene. The genetic variants within this gene have been shown to be strongly and consistently associated with obesity traits in various ethnic groups, in various populations, in men, in women, in adults, and also in children. So having seen such a strong effect of the genetic variation, the FTO gene variations on obesity, the first question that comes to our mind is, can this effect be modified by a lifestyle factor such as physical activity or dietary intake? So let me give you some examples of the gene physical activity interaction and gene diet interaction. So starting with the physical activity interaction. So I carried out a study in the UK population in the year 2009. That was, the study was done like immediately after the discovery of this obesity gene, because we wanted to know whether this genetic risk can be overcome by doing more <laughs> levels of physical activity. So this study was done in 20,000 people from the UK population. So in these 20,000 people were stratified into four different levels of physical activity. So basically some individuals were active, some individuals were moderately active, some individuals were moderately inactive, and some of them were physically inactive leading a sedentary lifestyle. On the y-axis, you find the BMI, which is an indicator of the common obesity. So here are the three bars that you see, the white, yellow, and green. The white bar is zero copy individuals, the yellow bar is one copy, and the green bar is basically two copy individuals. And we found that the genetic variant was significantly associated with BMI in all the levels of physical activity, where we found that individuals carrying two copies, they had significantly higher levels of BMI. But what was interesting in this finding is, the effects were highly prominent amongst those who were leading a physically inactive lifestyle or leading a sedentary lifestyle where the effect was 0.44. The 0.44 implicates if you carry one copy of the genetic variation, you will have a 0.44 kilogram per meter square increase in BMI for, for one copy. So if it is a two copy, then it means that 
your effect will be 0.88. That is a double the amount of what you would see for one copy individual. So if you're carrying two copies, then there's going to be a 0.88 kilogram per meter square increase in BMI every year if you don't do physical activity. So this clearly highlights the fact that if you lead a sedentary lifestyle, you're going to increase the genetic risk of obesity. Whereas if you look at the physically active lifestyle and other levels of physical activity, you can see that the effect is just 0.2, which is half of what you are seeing for the inactive lifestyle. So which clearly highlights the fact that doing even some amounts of physical activity can overcome the genetic risk of obesity. So having seen the protective effect of physical activity and doing exercise, now let's move on to the dietary intake. So this study was done in 11,000 people from five different European countries. And uh, here we basically followed up these uh, 11,000 people for three and a half years, so which was basically a longitudinal study design. And we found a very interesting interaction between the genetic risk and protein consumption on weight gain. So in this graph on the x-axis, you find the protein intake in percentage. On the y-axis, you find the weight change per year. The three lines that you see, they are basically individuals carrying high genetic risk, two copies, one copy, and zero copy. And from this graph, you can clearly see that as protein consumption increases, the annual weight change also significantly increases for people who carry two copies compared to individuals carrying one copy and zero copy, which means that if you consume a lot of protein rich foods, and if you're carrying two copies, then that's going to increase your risk of becoming obese over a period of time. So what would be the kind of a personalized diet for individuals carrying two copies? So the best way by which you can reduce the risk of weight gain for people carrying two copies will be lowering the total protein consumption. That is less than 17% of the total energy intake will be the best strategy to reduce weight gain for those who have a high genetic risk. Here, I'm not saying that low protein diet is healthier, but anything in excess can have a negative impact on health outcomes. And that's exactly what we have identified in this particular study. And the second uh, part of the same study, which was again focusing on 11,000 people from five different European countries, here we looked at the Mediterranean dietary pattern. So you know that the Mediterranean foods they are quite rich in omega-3 fatty acids, fruits, vegetables, and olive oil. So anyone consuming that kind of a healthy diet will obviously lose weight over a period of time. And that's exactly what we identified, but at the backdrop of your genetic susceptibility. So here we found that those individuals who are consuming higher amounts of Mediterranean foods over a period of time, they were able to overcome the genetic risk. So in this graph on the x-axis, you find the Mediterranean diet score, which means that higher the score, higher the consumption of the Mediterranean foods. On the y-axis, you find the weight change per year. And the three lines that you see, they're basically individuals with low genetic risk, moderate genetic risk, and high genetic risk. And you know that if you carry two copies or if you have high genetic risk, which means that you're likely to become obese over a period of time. But these high genetic risk people, some of the high genetic risk people, by consuming higher amounts of Mediterranean foods, they were able to overcome the genetic risk of weight gain, suggesting that a healthy diet such as a Mediterranean diet can overcome the genetic risk of becoming obese. So all these studies clearly highlight the fact that healthy lifestyle can overcome the genetic risk of obesity. So now let's move on to the status of nutrigenetics in developing countries. And one of the most important challenge in doing a nutrigenetic study in a developing country is the ethnicity. The ethnicity plays a very, very important role. As I said before, every ethnic group is unique. And what is so unique about each and every ethnic group? So let's have a look at the importance of conducting nutrigenetic studies in different ethnic groups. So first of all, every ethnic group has got a unique genetic makeup that we need to understand. And that is exactly the reason why we're able to differentiate people coming from Asia or people coming from, uh, from the UK or US or someone coming from uh, Latin American countries or someone coming from South Africa or someone from China. So you're able to identify the individual based on the physical appearance, and that is partly attributed to their genetic makeup. 
So every ethnic group has got a unique genetic makeup. And secondly, unique dietary pattern. But of course, there is a varying dietary pattern as well. For example, if you take Indian population, the Indian diet is very unique compared to the other countries. But within India, you can see there is a varying dietary pattern. North Indians consume a diet, which is so slightly different from that of the, the diet dietary pattern that you would observe in, this, in a South Indian population. And third, there is increased prevalence of diabetes and obesity across different populations, different ethnic groups in different developing countries. So without nutrigenetics, there is no future for personalized nutrition. So this is exactly the reason why I started this genuine collaboration. The genuine stands for the gene nutrient interaction. And the main objective of this collaboration is basically to implement nutrigenetic studies for the first time in contrasting ethnic groups. So the first nutrigenetic study was implemented in the Indian population and then in Sri Lankan population, in Indonesian population, in Brazilian population, in Ghanaian population, in Turkish population, in, and now we are doing it in the Peruvian population. And these are other lower middle income countries where we are trying to implement nutrigenetic studies through funds from various funding organizations, in addition to the ongoing collaborations in the developed parts of the world. And these are some of the publications from the genuine collaboration. And all these studies that have been published from genuine collaboration, they have clearly highlighted the fact that healthy diet and doing more levels of physical activity can overcome the genetic risk of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So the, this is exactly the main take home message from all these studies. So let me give you some of the examples of the study that I did as part of the genuine collaboration. So we all know that we all carry different level of genetic risk for becoming obese. So either you might be a low genetic risk person, or you might be a moderate genetic risk person, or you might be a high genetic risk person. So there's no individual who can say that they have a 0% genetic risk. There's no individual. Every individual in this world will have at least some level of genetic risk for obesity. But just because you're carrying genetic risk doesn't mean that you're going to become obese. You can overcome that genetic risk by modifying your lifestyle. So which means that there is a triggering factor. And that triggering factor, one of the most important triggering factor is your dietary intake. So we carried out the studies in different ethnic groups such as South Asia, Southeast Asia, West Asia, South America, and the West African population. And for each and every country, we found a unique dietary pattern as a triggering factor. So if you look at the South Asian population, India and Sri Lanka, in these two studies, we were able to show that individuals consuming high amounts of carbohydrates, you know that for South Asia, the main source of energy comes from the carbs. So we found that those individuals who were consuming higher amounts of carbohydrate, that is more than 500 grams of carbs per day, they showed an increased genetic risk of obesity. Whereas if you come to uh, coming to the South East Asia or West Asia, that is in Indonesia and the Turkish population, it was basically the dietary protein consumption. You know that Indonesians and Turkish population, they do consume significant amounts of meat products. So there's increased consumption of the animal protein. So surprisingly, we found that in both these population, there was increased consumption of total protein uh, intake. So where there was like more than 140 grams of protein per day was being consumed by some of the individuals living in Indonesia and Turkish population. Their dietary recommendations for protein consumption is only around 65 to 75 grams of protein per day. But these individuals, some of them were actually consuming more than what is required double the amount of what is required for that particular population. So that was shown to increase the genetic risk of central obesity. And for the Brazilian population, a similar finding was observed where there was like increased consumption of protein, which was more than 145 grams of protein per day. <clears throat> and coming to the West African population, which is the Ghanaian population, we found that there was increased consumption of the fat-rich foods. So when they exceeded 47 grams of total fat per day, or when they exceeding uh, 23 grams of saturated fat per day, that was increasing the genetic risk of obesity. The reason why I'm showing these different findings in different countries is that because you can clearly see that the dietary patterns are so different. So which means that findings, the nutrigenetic findings from one population 
cannot be used for implementing personalized diets for other population. Because that's exactly what these gene testing centers are doing at the moment. They are utilizing the findings from the European population and they are trying to implement personalized diets for lower middle income countries. And that's exactly the reason why some of the personalized diets work and majority of them, they don't work. So before going into a personalized nutrition strategy, or if you're going approaching any personalized nutrition company, please make sure that the protocol that they are following is based on the finding from your ethnic group. That is very, very important. And these are some of the other countries where we are trying to implement gene diet interaction studies. So let me give you another example of a gene diet interaction study, which we published earlier this year in Asian Indian population, which was focusing on the circulating adiponectin level. So adiponectin is basically a very important biomarker of obesity. You need to have good levels of adiponectin in your body to prevent yourself from becoming obese. So here we looked at the genetic risk and cardiometabolic health. And this study was done in, um, in, in the Chennai population. So we, we looked at 2,000 individuals, of which 1,000 individuals were type 2 diabetic and 1,000 individuals were controlled. So it was basically a case control study design. So we found that those individuals with high genetic risk, they had increased risk of cardiometabolic diseases. And interestingly, those individuals who had high genetic risk they also had significantly lower levels of adiponectin concentration. So if you look at this graph, you can clearly see that individuals with high genetic risk, they were having significantly lower levels of adiponectin concentration. And individuals with low levels of adiponectin, they showed an increased risk of cardiometabolic diseases. So in this triangular relationship, the main question that I had was, whether the association between genetic risk and cardiometabolic disease is that being mediated through adiponectin levels. So what I did, I tested for the association of the genetic risk and cardiometabolic diseases, adjusting for adiponectin. But after adjusting for adiponectin, there was no significant association between genetic risk and cardiometabolic diseases. So which means that the association of the genetic risk with cardiometabolic diseases is being mediated through adiponectin concentration. But how is this information helpful for us? So for example, if you're testing your gene, if you're looking at your genetic risk and you are getting to know that you carry two copies, which means that you have high genetic risk for cardiometabolic diseases. So once you know your genetic risk, you still have an opportunity to prevent the development of the cardiometabolic disease by boosting your adiponectin concentration. Because it's basically the adiponectin concentration which is mediating this association. So if you're able to boost your adiponectin levels, then you don't have to worry about your genetic risk. And for that, you need to know your genetic risk on the first place. Only if you know that, then you will have the intention or the motivation to boost your adiponectin level. But how can you boost your adiponectin levels? There are two ways. One is your diet. By consuming more amounts of omega-3 fatty acids, because adiponectin is considered as an omega-3 biomarker as well. And secondly, by doing more levels of physical activity, you can boost your adiponectin concentration. So these are the two important ways naturally by which you can improve your adiponectin concentration. Of course, there are some supplements and drugs which are available, but I would suggest going for the natural way of boosting your adiponectin levels to overcome the genetic risk of cardiometabolic diseases. And as part of the genuine collaboration, I also looked at the vitamin D and vitamin B12. So we carried out the study in Asian Indian population looking at obesity and vitamin D status, which is again a genetic study, a nutrigenetic study. So in this graph on the x-axis, you find the carbohydrate intake in turtiles. On the y-axis, you find the 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentration. And the black bar are those individuals with high genetic risk and the white bar are individuals with low genetic risk. And if you just focus on those individuals consuming low amounts of carbohydrate-rich foods, and those carrying low genetic risk. I'm not worried about the high genetic risk people over here. My consideration over here is only about people consuming uh, low amounts of carbohydrate and carrying a low genetic risk. And you can see that those individuals, they have significantly higher levels of vitamin D concentration. Because having high levels of vitamin D, good levels of vitamin D, or vitamin D sufficient status is very much important to prevent the development of various chronic diseases. So how can you improve that? So one way is 
if you're carrying a low genetic risk, because a lot of people do ask me, I'm carrying a low genetic risk. I just carry a zero copy. So what does that mean? Can I consume any kind of a diet? No. If you carry zero copy, it means that low genetic risk, even low genetic risk is also categorized as some level of genetic risk. In order to overcome that genetic risk, you should definitely consume a diet which is healthier and suitable to overcome that low genetic risk. And that's exactly what we had observed over here. So those individuals carrying low genetic risk by consuming low amounts of carbohydrate, by reducing the carbohydrate consumption, they were able to increase their vitamin D levels. Because that effect was not seen when you are increasing your carbohydrate consumption. That carbohydrate, low carbohydrate diet was basically overcoming that genetic risk, that low genetic risk and helping those low genetic risk people with improving their vitamin D levels. Another example for the B12 status. So here we were looking at those individuals who had genetic risk for B12 deficiency and those who do not have the genetic risk for B12 deficiency. And this study was done in Southeast Asian population, which is the Indonesian population. So in this graph, on the x-axis, you find the dietary fiber. On the y-axis, you find the HbA1c, which is a glycated hemoglobin, which is an indicator for type 2 diabetes. And you can see that you can see that the red bar is basically the B12 genetic risk and the blue bar is low B12 genetic risk. So those individuals who are consuming low amounts of dietary fiber, that is less than 40 grams of fiber per day, and those carrying a high genetic risk, they had significantly higher levels of HbA1c. So those individuals who are having high B12 genetic risk, if they are able to consume high amounts of dietary fiber, they can definitely reduce the levels of glycated hemoglobin. So if you know that you have high genetic risk, by modifying your dietary pattern, that is consuming more amounts of fiber-rich foods, you can overcome the genetic risk of type 2 diabetes by reducing your levels of HbA1c. So in summary, genuine collaboration provides the first evidence of gene diet interactions on obesity traits in these lower middle-income countries. So in terms of implementing a personalized diet for a particular population, you have to use the findings only from that particular population. You cannot use the nutrigenetic findings from one population and implementing personalized diet for the other population because that is the thumb rule for implementing any kind of a precision nutrition approach or so-called the personalized nutrition strategy. So just giving you some of the press release of the findings from the genuine collaboration, you can see that all the press release focuses on overcoming the genetic risk, whether it's heart disease or diabetes or whether it's obesity. All these studies are clearly highlighting the fact that you can overcome the genetic risk of cardiometabolic diseases by consuming a healthy diet and doing more levels of physical activity. So if you're interested in knowing more about what I'm doing as part of the genuine collaboration, this article is available online, so which was published in the Proceedings of the Nutrition Society last year, and which will give you an overview of the studies that I'm doing in different lower middle income countries. And also this particular publication, which is again focusing on vitamin B12 and vitamin D deficiencies, which, which was published a couple of months ago, and which is also giving an overview about what I'm doing as part of the micronutrient deficiencies. So with this background, let's move on to nutrigenomics. So we have seen a lot about nutrigenetics. So what is nutrigenomics? As mentioned before, it's a study of the role of nutrients in gene expression. So it all starts with your diet. The food that you're consuming has got all the nutrients, which includes all the macronutrients, micronutrients, carbs, fats, proteins, and all the minerals and vitamins and antioxidants. So the main objective of we eating food is basically to get the nutrients from the food. And these nutrients are entering inside your body. And these nutrients need to be absorbed by each and every cell. So these nutrients will enter into the cell. They go into the cytoplasm. But once they go into the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm, there are certain molecules which are eagerly waiting for the nutrients to arrive. And these molecules are nothing but the transcription factors. So these transcription factors have got two important functions. One is to bind to the nutrient. And secondly, to take the nutrient to the DNA, which is in the nucleus. So these nutrients with the transcription factor, they go and bind to the DNA. They nourish the DNA. They provide the energy for the DNA 
to translate the information in the DNA to get converted to RNA, proteins, and metabolites. So in response to a particular nutrient, there are certain RNA molecules which are produced, and that area of research is called transcriptomics. In response to a nutrient, there are certain proteins which are produced, which that area of research is called proteomics, and the metabolites which are produced in response to a nutrient, the study of those metabolites is metabolomics. So all these omics approaches, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, they all come under one big umbrella. That area of research is the nutrigenomics. And understanding these differences in the gene expression level. So these differences in the RNA expression level or protein expression level or metabolite expression level. So these differences are considered as a molecular biomarkers and understanding these at gene expression level will help us in the prevention of cardiometabolic diseases. So how can you prevent these cardiometabolic diseases? By implementing personalized meal plans based on your expression level. So if you know that you have an abnormality in your gene expression profile, so that gives you an opportunity to rectify your dietary pattern because your gene expression profile is a reflection of your dietary pattern. So if you have a good levels of all the proteins and RNAs and metabolites, then it means that you're following a healthy dietary pattern. But if your dietary pattern is completely unhealthy, that will be reflected in your gene expression profile. So that gives you an indication to rectify your dietary pattern. So that rectification of your dietary pattern, that is what we call as a personalized meal plan. So this is how we translate the finding from nutrigenomics to personalized nutrition. So it all starts with your dietary intake, which has got all the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, polyphenols, and all the, <clears throat> sorry, all the macronutrients. So these nutrients eventually, they need to be absorbed by different cells. So these cells could be adipose tissues or hepatocytes or pancreatic cells or brain cells or all kinds of muscle cells. So all these cells, they basically absorb the nutrients and for carrying out various metabolic activities and cell signaling mechanisms and expression of certain genes. And what are those genes? They, those are the genes which play an important role in maintaining the glucose homeostasis. So if there is an abnormality in your dietary pattern, that will automatically affect and disturb the glucose homeostasis. If your glucose homeostasis is disturbed, then that can lead to obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So for example, if you're consuming a food that is rich in phosphorus, we all know that the foods which are rich in phosphorus, they are strongly correlated with the increase in blood pressure and pulse rate. Several epidemiological studies have shown a direct link between the phosphorus-rich foods and increase in blood pressure and pulse rate. But this link plays a very, very important role in contributing to the nutrigenomic mechanism because these nutrients eventually they enter into the cell and they are regulating the genes which play an important role in blood pressure and hypertension. So that is how these foods are causing different diseases. So that is the underlying basis on which we do the nutrigenomic study. So if you look at the schematic representation of how the DNA is converted to RNA and RNA to proteins. So this whole process of the flow of information from DNA to protein, that is what we call as a gene expression. As I said before, the gene expression cannot happen on its own. You require an environmental stimulant. And what is that environmental stimulant? Your dietary intake. So the nutrients which are present in your diet, they enter into the nucleus, they go to the DNA, they bind the DNA and regulate the gene expression. And this is what is called as a study of nutrigenomics. So we have seen the genomics aspect, the transcriptomics, proteomics, and now let's move on to metabolomics. So there are several metabolites which are produced in your body in response to your diet. So the levels of the metabolites are basically a reflection of your dietary pattern. So understanding the levels of your metabolites, metabolic profiling, the area of research is called metabolomics. Metabolite expression levels are also equally important. The way the food that is interacting with your DNA is also interacting with your metabolite levels. So understanding the levels of the metabolite is very much important to understand the molecular basis of health and disease. By looking at your metabolite profile, I can tell you whether you're going to become obese or whether you're going to become diabetic. So how can you do this? 
So depending upon your research question, you can either do a human study or an animal study, and you can collect any kind of a sample like a blood sample. And from blood, you can collect the serum and plasma, or it could be urine sample or a stool sample, or even breast milk. So as I said, it depends on your research question. And there are different methods that are available for carrying out this metabolomic approaches. You can use a mass spec or NMR or any kind of a chromatographic uh, technology, depending on whether you want to do a targeted metabolomics or an untargeted metabolomic approach. So, for example, if you're doing a study in 1,000 people and you're collecting 1,000 urine samples and you're, you're looking at the 3,000 metabolites in each and every sample. So look at the data. The data that you're going to get from that analysis is going to be huge and massive. So you definitely need a sophisticated software to analyze all these information that you're collecting from different individuals. So the, there is a stage where you have to do the data analysis with a lot of statistical analysis that needs to be done. So I'm not going into the technical details, but the, the message that I want to give you is that at the end of the analysis, you get different peaks and each peak is a indication of the levels of a particular metabolite. And that is what is determining whether you're going to develop a, a disease or you're going to be uh, leading a healthy lifestyle. So this is basically how you do a metabolomic study. <clears throat> so this is just an example of an integrated omics approach, which has been used. This study was published in the year 2014 and where they used an integrated omics approach. So what they did was basically they collected the placental biopsy samples and they created a biobank. And with those samples, they carried out a multi-omics analysis. They got data from metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomics. And with that information, they used bioinformatics tools to create a molecular signature, which helped people to identify whether the infant is going to develop any neurodevelopmental defect. So from those infants, they also collected some samples and they integrated those samples into the biobank. So again, they also got some information on different omics approaches from the infant as well. So you have the placental profile and the infant profile. So this kind of a comparison that is retrospective comparison with the placental profile and a prospective comparison with the infant's profile that gives a very much of an integrated omics approach and which could also be used as a, a diagnostic marker for the developmental defects or the birth defects which could be identified using these nutrigenomic approaches. So we have seen what is nutrigenetics and what we have seen what is nutrigenomics. Let's briefly touch upon the impact of the diet on epigenetic modification, so which is what we call as nutri-epigenetics area. So this gen epigenetics is basically considered as a non-genetic area of research. The reason why I'm using non-genetics is basically because genetics is involving the genetic variations. So where there are some variations in the DNA. When you study epigenetics, there are no variations in the DNA. It's only the variation in the gene expression which is reflecting on your phenotype. So epigenetics refers to the heritable changes in the gene expression without any changes in the DNA sequence. There's a change in the phenotype without a change in the genotype. The phenotype is your physical representation of an individual, whereas the genotype is your genetic representation of an individual. So there's no change in your genes or there's no change in your DNA, but there's only a change in the phenotype. And one of the most extensively studied epigenetic modification is your DNA methylation. So where, as I said before, you have four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So in the DNA methylation, the methyl group is being added on to the cytosine nucleotide. And this methylation plays an important role in controlling your gene expression. So how does DNA methylation regulates your gene expression? Say, for example, you're not consuming a methyl-rich diet. Say, for example, you're consuming a completely unhealthy diet. The unhealthy diets, they do not have this methyl donors. So if the methyl groups are not available, the methyl groups cannot bind to the DNA. So the transcription factors can easily go and bind to the gene and regulate the transcription. So the gene expression is taking place continuously. So that can lead to overexpression of certain genes. If you are consuming a healthy diet, then what happens? The healthy diet has got a lot of methyl donors and these methyl donors can go and bind to the DNA. 
If these methyl groups are added onto the DNA, the transcription factors cannot bind. If the transcription factors cannot bind, the gene expression cannot take place. And this phenomenon is called gene silencing. So gene silencing is a very important mechanism which is controlling your gene expression because you don't want all the genes to be expressing the protein throughout the day. You don't need them 24 seven. You need the genes to be activated only when they are required. For example, if you're consuming a particular diet, then the food that you're consuming needs to be digested. So certain genes will have to be activated to produce the enzymes to digest the food that, you, uh, that you're consuming. You don't need those genes to be activated when you're not consuming any food. So that is exactly the reason when there is overexpression of the genes that can lead to overexpression of the proteins and that can lead to the development of chronic diseases like obesity or diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So DNA methylation plays a very, very important role. And this DNA methylation is possible only through your dietary intake. So there's a very strong nutri-epigenetic link between maternal diet and fetal growth. And that's why we say the first 1000 days of a child's life is very, very important. So the studies have clearly shown that the unbalanced maternal diet during pregnancy has shown to affect the fetal growth and which has shown to affect the development of cardiovascular disease risk when these infants become adults. And also the seasonal variations in the maternal methyl donor nutrient intake, especially during the periconsumptional period, that are shown to affect or influence the maternal plasma biomarkers, which have shown to have an impact on the DNA methylation patterns. And not only this, even obesity during pregnancy or diabetes during pregnancy, which is what we call as the gestational diabetes, they can all have an impact on the DNA methylation patterns. And also the micronutrient deficiencies during pregnancy, especially the vitamin D or vitamin B12, they have all shown to influence the DNA methylation patterns and can affect the fetal growth. And it can, it can, it can affect the newborn anthropometric measurements. So let me give you an example of... Uh, a study that we did where we looked at the vitamin D and the study is called vitamin D pregnant mother cohort study, which we did in 200 Indonesian pregnant mothers. So where we followed up all these pregnant mothers right from first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and we also measured the newborn anthropometric measurements and we measured the vitamin D status in these pregnant mothers. And the main question is, whether vitamin D deficiency during pregnancy, does it have any impact on newborn anthropometric measurements? So in this study, we found that those pregnant mothers, those in the third trimester, and those who had a high genetic risk, they show a significantly lower levels of vitamin D, 25 roxy vitamin D concentration. So, or in other words, individuals or the pregnant mothers who had high genetic risk, they showed a significant vitamin D deficiency during the third trimester. And these pregnant mothers who had high genetic risk and those who had vitamin D deficiency, they basically gave birth to babies which had a small head circumference. You know that the small head circumference at birth is highly correlated with the development of cardiometabolic diseases when these infants become adults. Several prospective studies have clearly identified that. So this study clearly showed that the vitamin D deficiency during pregnancy in those mothers who have high genetic risk, they are likely to give birth to babies with small head circumference and with, which can eventually lead to the development of cardiometabolic diseases. Because that's exactly why we say the first 1000 days of a child's life is very, very important. And the food and the nutrition that you provide to that child is going to determine the health status of th those children. So if you're able to identify your genetic risk during pregnancy. And if you're able to provide a healthy diet that is rich in vitamin D, that can prevent the abnormalities that are linked to the fetal growth. So foods rich in methyl donors. So these are all the foods which are rich in methyl donors. So that's why we say what you do and what you eat in the first 1000 days of your life, it makes a huge difference for the rest of your life. And that's why the epigenetic modifications are also very, very important when you're implementing a personalized diet for an individual. So we have seen nutrigenetics, nutrigenomics, metabolomics, and we have also seen epigenetics. Now let's move on to the impact of the diet on gut microbiome, because the food that you're consuming, it's not only interacting with your DNA, it's not only interacting with your metabolites, 
It's not only interacting with your gene expression or it is not only inducing the DNA methylation, it is also entering into your gut lumen where you have several microorganisms. And these microorganisms play a very, very important role. And these microorganisms are not just bacteria, also it includes viruses, phages, and yeast. We all carry two kilograms of the gut microbiome. And these gut microbiome, if you're nourishing the gut microorganisms properly, then they will release short chain fatty acids, the molecules which play a very, very important role in maintaining your mental health state, or maintaining your cognition levels, carrying out all the metabolic activities, lowering your risk of developing diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and most importantly, boosting your immune system. Immunity levels are highly increased, especially if you nourish your gut microbiome. So let's have a look at it. <clears throat> So what is the role of gut microbiota in health and disease? So in this particular figure, you can clearly see on the left-hand side, I've shown you the impact of the unhealthy diet on gut microbiome. On the right-hand side, where you have all the, the blue rectangles, it's, it is showing basically the, the impact of the healthy diet on gut microbiome. So if you look at this pink color rectangles, so those foods which are quite unhealthy, like sugary foods or foods which are rich in saturated fatty acids or excessive protein consumption or consuming antibiotics frequently, they can all have an impact on your gut microbiome composition and they can reduce the production of the short chain fatty acids and most importantly, increasing the production of the TMAO. TMAO is nothing but trimethylamine oxide. So if you're consuming a diet which is quite rich in meat products and dairy products, the trimethylamine from these products gets oxidized and it gets converted to trimethylamine oxide in your gut microbiome. So high levels of trimethylamine oxide has been shown to be associated with increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. So that can lead to the development of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and also reducing your immunity as well and increasing the risk of infection. So this is what happens if you're consuming an unhealthy diet, but what if you consume a healthy diet that is consuming a lot of fiber-rich foods and consuming a lot of probiotics, they can all improve your short-chain fatty acid production, improving your antioxidant levels in your body. So eventually they are improving your lipid metabolic pathways and lowering the gut inflammation and improving your insulin sensitivity and reducing your insulin resistance and preventing you from developing type two diabetes and most importantly, boosting your immune system by reducing the risk of several infections, including COVID-19. That's why during this COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people were asked to improve their gut microbiome, nourish their gut microbiome, and a lot of supplements were introduced in the market, especially to improve your gut micro, um, microbiome. So in terms of translating the finding from nutrigenetics to precision nutrition, it all starts with your dietary intake. The food that you're consuming interacts with your DNA, it interacts with your metabolites, it interacts with your gut, and last but not least, also it in interacts with your epigenetic modification, which is a DNA methylation. So all these four compartments are functioning in parallel as soon as you consume any kind of a food. So these four compartments need to be looked at as a four-way interaction, metagenome, hyperbolome, epigenome, diet interaction. And understanding this interaction is very much important for the implementation of the precision nutrition approaches. But the key question over here is, how are we going to integrate all this information into one model? Because developing one particular model where we can take information from different factors and you are going to develop a personalized diet for an individual. This is exactly what I call as a revolution in the field of nutrition because nutrition has always been tagged as a universal dietary recommendations which have been proposed by WHO. A lot of people have been following and people say I go to I go for a run every day and I eat healthy diet but still I'm not able to lose my weight. Why? Because your DNA is so unique and it's so precious and you need to consume a diet which is suitable for your DNA. But this consumption of this personalized diet has to be in a very proper and a very formal uh, uh, um, a proper way where you can use the findings from nutrigenetics from your ethnic group and accordingly the personalized diet should be implemented based on the finding from your ethnicity and from your population. So there's also a proper way or formal way of following and implementing the personalized diets. 
So looking at the precision nutrition in the era of artificial intelligence, so the deep phenotyping is definitely required. So if you look at this particular figure, I did cover all these topics in my talk today, looking at genetic, epigenetic, microbiome, metabolomic, and proteomics, and various other factors. But on this side, this is something I didn't touch. But that, those information are, are also equally important. You need to look at the stress levels of an individual, the sleep patterns, the geographical condition, the socioeconomic determinants, the early life, the first 1000 days of an individual, in addition to your dietary pattern, your physical activity levels. So a deep phenotyping of an individual is very, very much important and integrating all this information into one platform for which you definitely need the artificial intelligence or the robotics or what we call as uh, machine learning approaches. There are two ways by which you can do the machine learning approaches, which is a supervised way and unsupervised way. So these two ways by which you can develop different models for precision nutrition approaches or the personalized dietary recommendations for an individual based on an individual's genetic makeup, the gut microbiome, the metabolomics, nutrigenomics, social determinants, the blood parameters, the socio uh, socioeconomic status, the lifestyle, the dietary. Hello, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So taking into account of all these phenotypic measurements and implementing a personalized approach. So that is exactly where we are heading to. But in terms of the question that I raised in the beginning of my talk, precision nutrition, is it hope or hype? It's definitely there is a hope in future. But at this point of time today, if you ask me that question, definitely we are not in a position to implement a personalized diet because there is a lot of information that is lacking in the literature and that needs to be answered before we head towards implementing per, uh, precision nutrition or the personalized nutrition and there's a lot more to cover before we reach the level of the precision nutrition approaches so on this note i would like to thank all my genuine collaborators and also thank you all so much for listening to my talk if you have any questions, you can drop me an email at v.karani at reading.ac.uk and I'm available on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter as Vimal Karani. So thank you so much.